that makes you reign over sickness, that makes you reign over disease, that makes you reign over poverty, that makes you reign over situations of life. It is called the nature of righteousness. Just be conscious of that nature. beginning a series of teachings that I've titled Our Life of Faith. Our Life of Faith. Generally speaking, the subject of faith, it's one subject that has made so many believers feel uncomfortable, sometimes vulnerable or confused and altogether misunderstood. So you have Christians who will say things to you like, I'm trying to get this faith thing. I've been trying my faith, but it's not working. Or some will say, I don't even have faith, etc., etc. The blame, I must say, is not to the student. <laughs> The blame majorly has been in the way the ministers, the teachers, generally speaking, have communicated the subject of faith. And at the end of the day, when we are done with today, I believe, you will agree with me that faith is the easiest thing a Christian can ever live by. Hallelujah. It's the easiest thing you can ever do. Allow me to put it this way. Faith to a Christian is what breathing is to the natural man. Faith to a Christian is what breathing is to a natural man. So think about how breathing in and out is to you as a natural person. Do you need to pray? Oh God, when I inhale, help me exhale. Are you even conscious that you are breathing? That's how faith is to us. But because of the misinformation, it has become, unfortunately, a challenge. And my prayer today is that God will, by his grace and by his spirit, correct every wrong understanding that we have had in times past. Amen. If you get it right, you are true. If you get it right, there is no telling what you can do. You will be a terrorist to the nation of hell. Are you following? If you get it right, and by the Holy Spirit, I know you will today. Now, what has brought about the confusion? The confusion most times, or from the scriptures, is because we have failed to differentiate between who the new creation in Christ Jesus is and who the disciples were. At the time, Jesus was on earth. So when you read the Bible and you listen to Jesus' communication to the people at that time, and you want to use the same teaching to apply to the New Testament man, you confuse the New Testament man. Jesus, while he was on earth, never had anybody who was spiritually alive. All of them, Peter, James, and John, the only advantage they had is that they were living under the Old Testament and they had a high priest order that could you know, pray and atone for their sins, etc. But they did not have the life of God in them. So technically speaking, like Jesus mentioned in the book of John 8, 44, they were spiritually dead. 
So Jesus was limited in his manner of communication. Think about it. Until Jesus rose from the grave, nobody could be born again. Not even Peter. It was after his resurrection that any man could be born again, including the disciples. So here is Jesus, one with God, who has come from above, wanting to communicate spiritual truths to men of the senses. He was certainly limited. And so many times he will say to them, you can't even understand the things I want to say to you. One of such things included the subject of faith. I would like us to look at um, some scriptures as we move on. But before I start quoting scriptures in regards to faith, I want to also set another foundation right. You know, when you open your Bible and you look at the way it has been divided, you have the Old Testament and then you have what? The New Testament. According to the writers, the ones who put the Bibles together, the New Testament began with uh, the birth of Jesus. But that's not what the Testament is all about. You can't have a testament in force unless the testator is dead. Another word for testament is will. The will of a person, though documented, can never be in force unless the one who wrote the will is dead. Is that a yes or a no? So let's look at what the scripture says to us. Hebrews chapter 9, from verse 16 and 17. Hebrews 9, reading verse 16 and 17. It's important we see this verse of scripture so that we understand that when we read and all the things we read before Jesus went to the cross, All of that is not considered New Testament from God's perspective. The New Testament actually began when he rose from the grave. Now, verse 16, Hebrews chapter 9, it says, For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. 17. For a testament is in force after men are dead. Since it has no power at all while the testator lives. So when you talk about the New Testament, the New Testament in essence began after the death of Jesus. So everything Jesus did before his death, He's trying to bring in a new era, but he's limited because he's communicating with people who are spiritually dead. And that's a vital difference between the new creation man and those who lived under the Old Testament. So when you talk about the Old Testament, the Old Testament includes everything you saw from Genesis down to when Jesus lived on earth before he died. From God's perspective, praise the Lord. So let's look at Jesus trying to introduce the subject of faith to a group of people who technically are spiritually dead. That means they have no relationship with God. They have been disconnected from God. And he wants to introduce the subject of faith to them. Praise the Lord. Luke chapter 17 and verse 6. Hallelujah. So the Lord said, take note of that word, if. Are you with me? He's speaking to them. He said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea 
and it will obey you. If. 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 Who is he talking to? Spiritually dead men. Another verse of scripture. Matthew 21 and verse 22. He says, and what things you ask in prayer, he says one word, yeah, believing is actually supporting what you have read before. And what things you ask in prayer, he said what? Believing you will receive. He's talking to people who have no relationship with God. The first scripture you read, he said, if you have faith. In this one, he said, if you believe. I said there's a vast difference between this man and us today. The story changed after his resurrection. So he demanded of them that they should believe in him. He demanded of them that they should have faith, if they can have faith. Unfortunately, the disciples, even the great Peter, could not do that. For the mere fact that they did not have his life. They did not have his nature. They could not understand spiritual things. You remember the Bible tells us that the natural man cannot understand the things of God. Are you with me? So the disciples were in that category. No one could have the faith of God until they were recreated. No one. Another example that Jesus gave was when he spoke to the tree. Let's look at it. Mark. Mark 11 and verse 22. Again. It says, and Jesus answering said unto them, have faith in God. The literal rendering of that scripture says, have the God kind of faith. But how could they have the God kind of faith if they didn't have the God kind of life? Are you following me? And then he went on to say, if you say unto this mountain, that's what the God kind of faith will do, and you don't doubt, you shall have the things that you say. And I said to you, no one could have the faith of God until they were recreated. At this point, you and I should be grateful to God that we are living in a time that is totally different from the times in which these gentlemen lived. Jesus is love. Jesus cared. On several occasions, he was moved with compassion for the people. So he went out to heal their bodies. Are you with me? He raised the dead. He dealt with demons in their bodies. But as far as their spiritual life was concerned, Jesus could do nothing about it. If I may put it bluntly, Jesus never led anybody to Christ. In his artwork. Until after his resurrection. Because no man could receive eternal life until Jesus resurrected. So he could tell them things about the Father. He could say beautiful things about the kingdom of God. But these guys were spiritually dead. No wonder when he was talking to you and I, he said, listen, talking about the church, he said, greater things will you do than what I have done. Greater in the sense that I couldn't minister spiritual life to them. But right now, we are dispensers of spiritual life. He could only feed them when they were hungry with physical food. But now we can feed the one who is spiritually hungry with the word of life. Greater things we are doing in this time. Amen. Another beautiful scripture. 
Hebrews 12 and verse 2. The Bible says to us, I want to focus on the first two sentences. It says, looking unto Jesus, who? The author and who? The finisher of our faith. That means you can't receive this faith if you don't have Jesus in your life. Talking about the God kind of faith. So the most that the disciples could operate with was just sense knowledge faith. You see and then you believe. Are you with me? The God kind of faith believes even when it has no sin. Praise the Lord. I said today we are just laying a foundation. So when we became born again, what did we receive? We received his life. What is that? Eternal life. We received his nature. What is that? The nature of righteousness. Another thing that we received was his faith, the God kind of faith. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. It says, For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, take note of the last sentence, as God has dealt to each one, what? The measure of faith. The New King James says, A. The King James says, the measure of faith. This is something the disciples never had. So all through Jesus' teachings, one key thing that was always represented, he will tell them, if thou can believe. If only you can believe. If only you can believe. Have faith. Get faith. But to us, there is no way you will find in the scripture... Now, if you read the Pauline epistles, the epistles written to the church, there is no way you will find where Paul is addressing the church and he tells the church, get faith or try and believe. Why? We are already believers. We already are people of faith. The very thing that the disciples didn't have, we have it. God gave it to us. How did we get it? We got it with the gospel. Romans 10 and verse 17. When the gospel was preached to you and I, faith was imparted into our spirit. Look at Romans 10, 17. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The measure of faith has been given to every one of us. And that is why you have believers who have come to the end of the road. They are looking for something they already have. I'm trying to get faith, pastor. I don't have enough faith, pastor. I don't know if my faith can work. Do I have faith for X, Y, Z? You remember when Jesus was speaking about the signs concerning us Christians? He says, this sign shall follow them that do what? Talking about us. He said, in my name, they shall cast out demons. He didn't say if they have faith. Because they are the believing ones. They have come into this family of God where faith is just normal to them. Like breathing is normal to the natural man. So there is no such thing as a Christian that does not have faith. There is no such thing. The day you got born again, faith was imparted into your spirit. I pray with all my heart that this will liberate you. It does not matter what the situation is. If you will start to understand that I have the faith of God, the faith that God himself used in creating this whole world is the faith that is alive in me now then you can understand when he says you have overcome them 
He didn't say you overcome them small, small, or little by little. Mm -mm, Pastors, you have overcome already. Why? Because everything that you need to be a victor in life is given to you already. So Paul never said to any believer, believe. Why? Because we are believers. (laughs) Second Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13. Another interesting scripture. This is Paul now addressing the church. Look at what he says to us. He says, and since we have the same spirit of faith. Did you see that? He's not trying to tell you get faith. He's reminding you, you already have it. If you have what moves the mountains. If you have the things that destroys any challenge, why do we operate below our status? When a challenge comes your way, whether in the form of sickness, whether in the form of disease, whether it's a financial issue, why do we feel afraid? Because you are not conscious of the fact that you have the God kind of faith. My prayer is that you will come to realize that indeed you have been equipped to function on earth as a king. You will come to understand that you are greater than the opposition. You are bigger than the challenge. Even Satan is afraid of you. Death is afraid of you. Praise the Lord. So when you heard the gospel, the good news, faith was imparted into your spirit. Now that faith made you a member of God's family when you accepted the gospel. Now that you are a member of God's family, what you need to be busy with is to know what your inheritance in Christ is. As a member of the family, what has Jesus done? The finished works. Because everything he finished is yours already. 1 Corinthians 3.21 tells us, all things are yours. He didn't say it will be yours if you pray enough, if you fast enough, if you believe enough. He says they are yours. He says, for all things are yours. The same way God will say, all things are mine. (laughs) He does not need faith for that. All things are yours. If you can get this, I said to you, you are true. You will discover your all night praying for two shillings, for ten shillings is futile. The cries you have cried. You should bring it to an end. What are you supposed to do? You are supposed to use your faith. Because you have something that puts the whole world at your doorstep. If you understand that what he just said, he gave to every man the measure of faith. What's the difference between a Christian who is having better results than the other? It's a function of knowledge. And willingness to use what you have. Praise the Lord. I also want to show us how Jesus spoke about the church prophetically before he left. Remember I told you everybody he was dealing with on earth were not born again. They were spiritually dead. They didn't have his life. So they could not operate the God kind of faith. I've also mentioned to you that Paul, on the other hand, he's talking to Christians. So he never once mentioned try and have faith. He emphasized the fact that you already had faith. Now look at Jesus also now. So you don't think that the two of them are on opposite ends. Jesus is speaking prophetically now about the church. Let's hear what he said. John 14 And verse 14. 
Did you see what he said here? He said, if you ask anything in my name, what did he say? Did he say if you believe? Did he say if you have faith? But I prayed in the name of Jesus. Why do you add the other clause? I don't know if my faith is strong enough to get it. Look at the statement here. I said this is the reason we have become confused. This is the reason some of us are at the end of our road. And questioning whether the faith issue is working. You're looking for something you already have. The name of Jesus is given to no other person but the church. Jesus is the one who fought the battle with Satan and gave us the victory. He said, now listen, use my name. It's like giving the church the power of attorney. Use my name. He says, if you ask anything in my name, you make a demand in my name, I will do it. But what we said and tell you, and I said because of wrong teaching also, is your faith big enough? This was the situation that Peter and John faced when they had to deal with the lame man at the gate. The lame man expecting arms from them. And Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. No prayer, no prayer prayer of agreement, no intercession, no long hours, just rise up and walk. Why? They understood this. He said, if you make a demand in my name, I will do it. Simply, just that. Make a demand in my name. Why? Will you do that? You have a right to the use of the name. He's giving you the power of attorney to use his name. If you will simply make that demand in his name, Jesus said, I'm not going to be asking whether you have faith. Is your faith big? Is it small? Is that how we do it? Why? You're already a believer. You have come into the family. The name of Jesus is given only to the church. Listen to me. You cannot use the name of Jesus in heaven. Why? He is there himself. Let me put it this way. The ambassador of Kenya to the U.S., for example, cannot come to Kenya as an ambassador to speak on behalf of the government, can he? His office is in U.S. He represents the government in U.S. He speaks on behalf of the government in the U.S. The reason he can't do it in Kenya is because the government is present. Whoever is in charge of the government is present. They speak for themselves. You can't use the name of Jesus in heaven. Jesus is there. This is where the name is used. You can't use the name of Jesus in hell. The name is given to our people on planet earth. The church. In hell is already a place where disembodied spirits are. They've been judged there already. But if any demon comes on earth, this is your terrain. The name is given to the church. He said, cast him out. He said, if you will make a demand in my name. He didn't say, if you will have a pastor pray in my name. He said, if you, the believing one, if you, the one who got saved, if you, the one who said, Jesus be my Lord, who has been given the right to the use of the name, if you will just make that demand in my name. He said, I will do it. So I dare say to you, you don't even need faith to use the name of Jesus. Just use it. If you got to your house today and you have the keys to your house, do you need faith to use the key? The key opens the door. The name commands the attention. The name commands the results. The name commands whatever you demand. The name does it. Because in the name of Jesus simply means Jesus was the one acting at that time. 
This is the reason Christians have become confused because they feel I don't have enough faith. I need to be a deacon. I need to be a, a, a archbishop. I need to grow more before I can do more. There is no such thing in that scripture. Take a look at it again. He says, if you ask anything in my name, what did he say to you and I? He said, I will do it. Come on, tell your neighbor he said he will do it. Say it like you mean it. Say it one more time. Another scripture I'd like us to see. We're talking about Jesus is speaking prophetically about the church. John chapter 15 and verse 16. Hallelujah. John 15 and verse 16. Look at it. He said, you did not choose me. <laughs> but I chose you. Listen. Listen. When I read that verse of scripture, that sentence alone, I get excited. In other words, Jesus knew what he was getting when he chose me. There is nothing about me that is a surprise to him when he chose me. So if I wake up tomorrow and I say, I'm a very expensive daughter of God, I like five stars. He's not short, he will supply. He knew what he was getting when he chose me. So where you are is a function of what you want. Don't blame God. If you can dream big, you will get it. But if all you have is your small-minded dreams, then don't blame God. He already said all things are yours. It's what you want and that's what you will get. No limitations. He said, you did not choose me. But I chose you and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. Listen to that. That whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give you. The word may there does not mean if he likes. No, he's certainly saying he will not do it. Whatever you ask, whatever you ask, what is whatever? So some people say, oh, God will give you your needs. He won't give you your want. What is whatever? Are you with me? You need to understand your relationship with God. You are not a servant. You are a son. A son with inheritance. A son to whom all the blessings has been assigned to. You were simply called into Christ to inherit, come and partake of the blessings. No more work needed. No extra work needed. No limitations. He said, whatever you ask, 